Get down with D and D. Yeah, you know me. Get down with D and D. Yeah, you know me. Get down with D and D. Yeah, you know me. Who's down with D and D? Down with D and D. Yeah, you know me. Get down with D and D. Yeah, you know me. I'm down with D and D. Yeah, you know me. Who's down with D and D? Welcome to Down with D and D. I am Sean Merwin, and I am here with my late night voice. My crazy wild late night voice, because we're recording late night, uh, at least for me, with none other than the nomadic Teos Abadia. I'm coming in from the storm, except it's supposed to be uh, snow. Yeah. And instead it was toxic smoke. So, but yes, I have, I have fled from my home to a different home. Uh, and that's part of the reason why we are recording at this late hour on a different day. Yeah. So, so Teos is role playing a nomad. And uh, he's really getting into it when he when he role plays. He he takes his whole family and his pets with him. I mean, he's he's serious about this role playing. Yeah, I LARPed um, a 26 hour car drive. So that was good. Yep. But luckily, we are uh, able to still through the miracle of technology, uh, record a podcast. Yeah. And, you know, my day job is in uh, chemical toxicity type issues. So if you are in the smoke area, uh, which is at least three states, if not five to nine of them, uh, please do not get yourself exposed to that. Uh, wear a, a mask when you go out and do it very, as, as briefly as you can hopefully do so and get back inside and filter the air inside because this stuff is really bad. Uh, and, and so um, sorry for everybody who has to go through that, all the listeners that have to go through that. Uh, my heart is with you. Yeah. I mean, and then you have in the South, you have flooding. Uh, and I mean, when, when a pandemic is like the third most, uh, yeah. you know, virulent thing happening in the, in a country, uh, you have to take stock, yeah. but so well, take care of yourself, everyone. Yeah, please. And if you are safe and sound and ready for a little fun, we have a lot of D&D news. The news does not stop for anyone, uh, whether it be real life or D&D. Uh, the, our first bit of news uh, happened a while ago, but we're just getting to talk, to it, uh, talk about it now. Avalon Hill was a subsidiary of uh, Wizards of the Coast until now. Now it is, has been moved to become directly under the auspices of Hasbro which in itself would be news, but a strange website went up counting down to Tuesday, September 22nd at 12 p.m. Eastern. And that website talks about a game you may well know from the past called Hero Quest. Yeah, that is something else. Um, so, you know, Hero Quest, uh, this is a game that came out late 80s, I think, had a bunch of expansions. Mm -hmm. And looking online, it's like, there are so many rabid fans of this thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a game that is, well, I'm trying to like how to best explain it. You know, it's like a D and D in that there is a person who plays the role of team evil. Mm -hmm. um, and there are what you would recognize as D and D inspired character classes. Yep. You know, you have barbarian and you know, there's a dwarf and that kind of thing. Uh, and you sort of run around this map that changes completing quests uh, with a sort of light combat movement type system. It's a little bit like, you know, Wrath of a Shardalon or Dungeon or one of those games that feel, you know, you just know this so feels like D&D, &D, but it's a lighter form of that, right? Yeah. And, you know, so a lot of people who played this game then said, hmm, what is, I wonder if this is like D&D &D and moved into D&D &D from yeah. that. And, so this is an interesting development. It was originally owned by Milton Bradley, which was then acquired by Hasbro. So that's how Hasbro uh, retained the rights to it. And with Avalon Hill now moving over to Hasbro, at first I was worried because Avalon Hill was making a lot of you know, D&D-ish games. And so pulling Avalon Hill away from Wizards of the Coast, I worried that that would be less. But now that HeroQuest is coming, I'm wondering if... They're going to tie this together and make it sort of a another on ramp for for D and D, which would be yeah, great. Yeah, and we also saw that a uh, couple episodes ago. We talked about that introductory game mm -hmm. that had like the Hasbro logo on it, not the Wizards of the Coast logo. And I wonder if that's yeah. linked to this. 
Yeah. So it, it says, and if it is, then it further confirms what you're saying, which is that Avalon Hill moving to Hasbro doesn't necessarily preclude lots of D&D inspired games. Right. And under Hasbro, you would think Avalon Hill would have a lot more reach than it, it did under Wizards of the Coast. Because greater resources. Right, right. Because Avalon Hill has always sort of been the the hardcore gamers board games, right? Uh, yeah. As opposed to Hasbro, like Monopoly and uh, people, you know, whatever you call Meritrash or whatever you call those, those sorts of games. So, you know, giving, giving them more of a reach via Hasbro, again, opens up a, another lane, hopefully, to bring people into D&D. And um, folks may not know, you know, uh, that Hasbro operates very independently from Wizards and Wizards independently from Hasbro. Mm-hmm. So it, I do suspect that while they, of course, can, you know, do a phone call to each other and whatnot, like, I mean, they really would be acting as independent units. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, that is how Wizards, you know, Wizards does not have, I don't know, to my, I, mean, I don't know this for sure, but I don't think they have Tuesday meetings with Hasbro to go over, you know, what sure. the next book is, right? It's, it's right. a, you're over there doing your thing, keep it, keep it going. Mm-hmm. And if you want to see a hilarious video that talks about hero quest just go to youtube and type in the best thing about hero quest um there is an amazing uh, video of a of an of a reboxing slash unboxing of hero quest if you want to know more about it in sort of a lighthearted manner yeah it's fantastic so i think this is exciting uh whenever this comes out i suspect we will all be buying or a lot of us will be buying hero quest because it's a really neat game yep. yep maybe we'll even try to play it online so, Sean, yeah, I heard that the season ten Adventures League rules are out. They they are they are, and they, they just happened uh, yesterday, I believe. Uh, we're, we're recording this on uh, when today's Wednesday, Wednesday, right? We're yeah, we're recording on Wednesday. So Tuesday, when season ten went live, uh, they released those rules, and. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail on them because to be completely honest, I have not read them all. Uh, I am an adventures league administrator, but I work on the Eberron side of things. So I wasn't involved uh, directly in this. Well, but I heard everybody loves them. Is, is that, is that true? <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I know. I, I, yeah. I think what, what's fair to say is that, um, they are, they have a lot of exciting, uh, changes in them that, uh, it's going to take time to digest. Right. And, and think about, and I think even time for wizards to think about everyone's reaction and sort of react to them. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, at least from the initial things I saw, it sort of suggested that, that, that the admins, it's not like just the admins put them together. So the admins have to kind of go back and discuss with wizards and, and clarify some questions people have. But I think the big thing around it is that it has a stronger focus on what was termed seasonality before. Mm-hmm of which characters can do what in which seasons and whether you're receiving rewards or not. And I think that's going to take some time to digest. Yeah. And and what this all comes down to, we don't even need to delve into the specifics because what this always comes down to for organized play campaigns is the longer a campaign goes on, the harder it becomes to bring in new players. So you really need a way an on-ramp a clear, easy path for new players to, to come into a campaign. And inevitably that upsets the players that have been in the campaign already because clearer paths for new players involve clearing the way. And sometimes that clearing the way hampers the play of people who are already in the campaign. And so there's always, there's always that balance. There's always that uh, idea of supporting current play versus bringing in new play and there will always be um, friction between that so uh, you know that's that's the 30 second summation of 20 years of experience uh, for me having worked in both the main campaigns and in side campaigns of organized play um, it's always going to be there so uh, we have a link to it if you haven't downloaded them yet if you are a if you're not an adventures league player uh now's a good time to look and see what they're doing and see if you want to get more involved. Uh, The other thing that was released was the first adventure 
uh, for the season 10 storyline called Ice Road Trackers. So you could pick that up on the DM skill. I don't know. Who wrote it, Sean? Anyone decent? I, I refuse to answer on the grounds that I may incriminate myself. <laughs> uh, you wrote it. It's awesome. Everybody should get it. Okay. Um, and yeah, and, and there's there will be a link in the show notes so you can download that adventure. You should totally check it out. It's very cool. Uh, and I've now run this many times uh, at the various online conventions and we'll be running it again this weekend. And mm-hmm. it's super fun to run as well for, for DMs. Yep, I will be running it. And as long as, you know, as long as I change enough of it to make the adventure good as the DM, then I then then, then the players have fun. Uh <laughs> And if you are a subscriber to the D&D newsletter, you can actually get for free the first mission of that adventure. Uh, you, you can go to uh, the D&D website. There is a D&D newsletter. You click that. You give them your email. They will send you their newsletter, and there is a link to it uh, in that newsletter. Yeah. And speaking um, of D&D celebration, that's happening uh, starting in two days. Yeah. yeah, that's super. I mean, wow. Yeah. These uh these online conventions, one after the I mean, we're still in packs. Right. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> and, and we already have D&D celebration adding to it. Uh and they just revised the list of streams and adjusted the schedule somewhat. Uh so that is super exciting. Yep. If you go to Wizards and D&D celebration underscore schedule, uh you can see the uploaded revised schedule. It's got a little bit of everything that's scheduled. I like how the lay, how it's laid out. It's very easy to, to see mm-hmm. uh, what's going on. Um, yeah, we mentioned last time the Acquisitions Incorporated game. So it looks like uh, Holly Conrad is returning as Strix. So that's who's coming back to uh, the game. Hasn't been there for some time. A couple of different games. Uh, yeah. Yep. Yep. Be nice. And uh, if you want to hear at PAX a panel with Teos and I talking about playing D&D the Acquisitions Incorporated way, you can catch that Thursday, the 17th at 8.30 p.m. It's called The Proper Care and Feeding of Your Franchise, D&D the AI Way. Yeah, that's, that's uh, you know, I recorded this with you and I still want to listen to it. It's that good. I, I almost never listen to anything I've recorded and I think I actually may go back and listen to that because I'm running it right now, and I want to remember what I said. <laughs> it was fun. I, 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 it, this is a thing that I've wanted to do for a while, right? And you, you and I have talked about this. Like, we should talk about how you can take the Acquisitions Incorporated book and use it in all kinds of different adventures in all kinds of different ways. And, and I think we did that uh, well in this in this yeah. Uh, seminar. So. Yeah, it, and it was even uh, more timely for me because, like I said, I'm in the middle of running the campaign from the book and I'm, I'm, I'm picking up things that I didn't even remember I had done. And I'm like, Oh, that was a good idea. I'm glad Teos probably, or, or Scott probably added that later, but <laughs> I doubt it. You, you, yeah. you, uh, I, when I ran it, I loved the sections you wrote and I thought uh, it's just, there's so much clever stuff in there. So. Well, I can't wait to get, I'm almost to the sections you wrote. So, so we'll probably take wow. a steep, steep downhill uh, slide mm-hmm. from there, but we'll, we'll find out for sure. So that's, now, yeah. Thursday. What yep. else is going on with PAX? Uh, let's see. That that uh, Friday is the Ack Inc. pre-show with the C-Team's Better Advice Panel. If you've ever been to a PAX and seen one of their advice panels, it's kind of funny. Uh, they take questions from the audience and then they answer in character, usually, uh, from their, their C-Team's character yeah. point of view. Uh, you know, a bunch of very clever folks. Pretty funny. Uh and you mentioned the uh, Ack Inc. live game where five years have passed since they have come back from Avernus. So we're going to find out what happened while they were gone. And you mm. can, you can only imagine what they came up with, uh, with using that as a promise. Yep. And the return of Strix, of course. Yeah. What about Sunday? You've got a, another seminar then. Yeah. I have one panel on Sunday that I did with Mr. James Intracasso called box text brawl writing better adventures where we have a knockdown drag out fight over whether you should use box text in your adventures and uh you know i i i beat him pretty soundly but i don't want to brag about it so uh but you can you can listen on sunday it's on uh pax 2 the channel pax 2 
I don't remember the exact time. I think it's 1130 a.m. Eastern or maybe 1130 a.m. Pacific, but it's on the uh, schedule. If you go to online.packsite.com slash schedule, you can see the full schedule. I look forward to this. I, I'm a big fan of box text, but, mm -hmm. um, but I like the conversation because it forces those of us who like box text to do a better and better job at it because we know that they're going to be those James and Picasso's nitpicking yep. everything we did. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and, and James is of course, super bright and yeah. you know, his, his take on it is, is excellent. And it does make you, if you're a designer, think better about box text uh, when you write it. And yep. speaking of, bright people saying things. I want to skip to Greg Marks's new series for Cobalt Press uh, because he does an excellent job of talking about exploration, specifically traps. As a designer, what you need to be thinking about when you design a trap in your adventure. Yeah, this is an awesome series. You know, a lot of times you get um, like, like someone just explained to you like what they think you should do. Uh, but this not only does that, he applies the design principles he's talking about mm -hmm. through this process of creating the entrance to a goblin lair mm -hmm. and, and, and how you apply those various questions that you should be asking yourself as a designer of a trap or traps. And mm -hmm. it's really, this is a great, this is the start of a series like yay, Cobalt Press, good choice with Greg Marks and yep. great start, Greg. Yeah, I mean, it's it's so insightful. It, this is what I love to read when I read a blog. Uh, this is exactly what I want. Yeah. So uh, check it out. It's on the Cobalt Press website. Uh, and just it should be one of the first articles that you find up there. So speaking of things up on the web, let's talk about a DMs Guild release that we wanted to highlight. This is called Theriad's Lost Verses. So since we were talking about uh, the mythic odysseys honk. of Theros, honk. honk. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I, I figured Ginny would like me to do that. So I right. just had to interrupt you with honking and, and then we can explain why. But Yes, there is a reason for the honking. So uh, lead designer Alan Patrick, along with designers Ginny Loveday, Jennifer Patrick, and Joshua Mendenhall have given us a great supplement for the Theros book, which we just finished talking about uh, last show. So the concept of this, it's loosely organized, organized around legends of a devil bird that exists in the wild spaces of the world. And Teos, do you, would you like to explain what, uh, <laughs> what this devil bird actually is? I mean, it is a goose. Right. And uh, I think it has to do with a certain popular video game, but it is not just a goose. It's a goose that kind of appears in various forms, but it's, I guess, final form is kind of like a goose Tarrasque. Mm -hmm. Which is <laughs> really every world needs a goose Tarrasque, I think. <laughs> well, that is true. Yeah. I mean, we know that is true. So I mean, just based on that concept alone, this is hilarious and, and wonderful. But the, the uh, you know, the, the, the core of this is actually very sound. Um, so there are these theriatic trials that you must go through as you deal with this menace. Um, so it starts with new magic items, a new mythic destiny. There's a new subclass option for each class. Uh, some, yeah, these uh, are pretty cool. There's some pretty yeah. neat. Uh, the the various like the cleric saga domain, the barbarian path of the bleeding, the beating heart. Mm -hmm. um, there's some there's some really good design here, and again, one for every single class. Yeah, that's, that's tough. Of work. And and they are they're really well done, and they really fit into this sort of Greek mythology. Um, yeah. So so the yeah. the cleric the saga cleric right the uh, even the rogue is is this like hubris figure. Yeah. Um, who's who's thinking that he is better than than the gods themselves, and and his skills show that. And it's and the, it's just the wizard path uses arcane tattoos, and and there are some rules there. And some of the I think the bard has a new spell. There are new spells and sprinkled throughout some of that. Yep. And if all of that isn't enough for you, there are also three adventures uh, in this product: the Fires of Heresy, which is for levels four to seven. 
uh, Drowning in Despair, level six to nine, and Furnace of Invention, levels eight to 11. So these can be either dropped into an existing campaign, or you can use them as part of this ongoing mythic uh, Teriatic Trials campaign. Yeah, it's pretty neat. Uh, and to support that, you have a bunch of new monsters. And these monsters, like, I would pick this up just for the monsters. I mean, sure. Blood Gorger Worm. Mm -hmm. Sold! Cockatrice yeah. Swarm. Sold! <laughs> yeah. uh, miniature Nyxborn Adiug. And then Sold. you got your various devil geese. Well, your devil geese, of course. <laughs> and we talked about those mythic monsters last time. Mm -hmm. And they have taken uh, this to heart. They have the mythic Sisters of the Poisoned Promise. Yep. And the mythic uh, non-player, a mythic non-player character who is an oracle. I, I don't know yeah. to what it's, you know, it might be a bit of a spoiler, but the, these are um, really neat monsters, really well designed. Uh, they have, I, I feel they're like there's some Alan Patrick essence here. Whenever you have like a blood gorge or worm, that's like, yep. that's so Alan Patrick. He is Mr. Tentacles and worms and yep. Caius and, and yeah, yep. mind flares, yeah. When you say Caius at the same time as someone else, I think that's probably a bad omen. Yeah. yeah. I'm looking, looking out my window right now. Yeah, so this is highly recommended. It's $17, mm -hmm. but again, it's, a, it's packed with everything. It's just uh, $16.99 gets you all mm -hmm. of these subclasses, spells, magic items, mythic destinies. And if you're going to run the mythic uh, Theros, then this is a great way to do it. Yep. Now, speaking of Cobalt Press again... Uh, Cobalt Press has a Kickstarter just went up a couple of days ago called the Scarlet Citadel, a Dungeon of Secrets. This is a classic multi-level dungeon for 5th edition, a place of dungeon crawling, treasure looting, and morphing battle maps. Mm -hmm. um, it's an, so it's an adventure from Cobalt Press, specifically Steve Winter. Now, if you don't know who Steve Winter is and you say you're a D&D &D fan, shame on you. Uh, so Steve has been working either at TSR or Wizards forever, and and then he went on to work uh, with Wolfgang Bauer at Cobalt Press, and you know he does a lot of design development, editing, and so on. And I've never seen a product associated with Steve Winter's name that wasn't first class. Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, even just seeing his name, I'm like, okay, sold. And so it sounds like this is going to be a, an all dungeon adventure for levels one to 10, sort of going back to the old style of there's one town and that's where you live and that's where you go back to. But for the most part, you're just going into these dungeons and, and dealing with all the mystical, magical, crazy things that are there. Awesome. So, yeah, Steve's great. He's yeah. done amazing work. Uh, one of the legends of our hobby. Mm -hmm. So uh, check that out on Kickstarter. It's called the Scarlet Citadel. And last for a, a little bit of sort of <laughs> funny news uh, to, to show just how far that D&D has seeped into the culture of our world. There are now official D&D costumes being sold at spirit halloween stores um for yeah. you, so the i've already been threatened by two different people to buy me the dungeon master from the cartoon outfit uh, with <laughs> I the, see you wear that yeah yeah well i mean if i let my hair grow long mm -hmm. would, i would already look like that for the most part well, so, you know, and it has the hairline, uh, yeah. you know, kit. It has like a yeah. sort of skull cap with hair on the side that, that right. comes as part of it. And then the red outfit. Yeah. My, yeah. my home group, I, I strongly believe will probably buy that for me, uh, which that. is, which is horrifying because if I asked for money could, because I needed it for food, they wouldn't give it to me, but for <laughs> this, they would hand it over. Uh, but not only that, uh, what if you're a couple Teos? What if you're, Oh, so well, we'll, of course, we'll, what we would do get? is we would buy the his and hers costume of choice, which is Caddy Bree and Driz Dord. And, and mm -hmm. honestly, what I really want, I mean, the costume's actually pretty good. These costumes actually, I think, really look cool. Uh, and you don't necessarily have to say that you're these characters. You can just be like fantasy character type things. They look fine. Mm -hmm. And it comes with swords and bows and a D&D journal and a molded tavern look coffee mug thing. But I, what I want is I want the footage of the meeting 
where people <laughs> had to discuss which characters yeah. to put in this, right? Yeah. Because Caddy Bree, like, I mean, I like her because obviously she's cool in a D and D way, but like that is not a super fleshed out persona, despite yeah. being in a lot of books. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. Like, it, it's a really interesting choice. Again, I'd love to see the video of the meeting where they decided Cadbury because it's not your most recognizable True. character. Yeah. But the but costume the, is really cool. So, you know, I guess who cares in the end? It's it's a neat costume. And geez, Spirit Halloween has a and d page and D&D themed. Right. You know what? Like official, right? Not not just like a, a knockoff. This is licensed. Yeah. Licensed. Yeah. So right there next to Naruto and you know, yeah. Avatar and, and all that. Yeah. It's crazy. Good times. Crazy, crazy world we're living in. Yeah. You cannot question 2020. I mean, you should, but. Right. <laughs> yeah. It is. It is amazing what that this year has thrown at us, including Spirit Halloween. Yep. So with the release of Icewind Dale, Rime of the Frostmaiden, we will be covering that book in future episodes. But first, we want to give a quick introduction to Icewind Dale as a location and as a historical place in the D&D world. Uh, so with that in mind, I'm going to ask Teos, what is Icewind Dale? So it is the region to the far, far northwest, the far northwest corner of the Sword Coast. So yes, you're kind of still in the Sword Coast. For those of you who complain about D&D being there too often, I don't think it's a bad thing. But you are so far to the northwest that maybe you're not on the Sword Coast or it doesn't have to feel like the Sword Coast. Mm -hmm. You are, you know, up in the regions that are inhospitable it's a cold dangerous location um and so it's remote from all those things that have been part of other campaigns mm -hmm. yeah for for me it doesn't count as part of the sword coast even though it's on the same coast as water deep and neverwinter and luskin and so on because it's so different um it is the land of ice and snow it is the land of harsh survival uh, it is the place where you would want to run a campaign if you wanted something that was known by many, many people, but still mysterious enough that you could do a lot of different things with it. Yeah, that's a great point. Yep. And yeah. And traditionally, it's it's a place, it's a location in the Forgotten Realms where people go to to start a new life and i think that's an app comparison because it can also be a great place to start a new campaign mm -hmm. and to get a to kind of change up what you've been doing with your adventuring group like if you, you know, if you want to put the players through a different experience than this land of ice and snow bone chilling winds blowing off the ragged glacier like this is a cool way to do that yeah and even though it is sort of a a desert of of snow there is still enough of a different feel for the different areas because you still have civilization it's not the metropolises that you're used to in the south but there are the ten towns um, and so if you want to run uh, an adventure or even a campaign where there is always a tavern to go to you can do that and there are 10 different locations to, to use. So you can yeah. even keep mixing it up a little bit there. Now, if you want to get away from civilization, you have the mountains that you, that you, can, you can always go to. Um, the spine of the world to the south. Uh, you have the sea of moving ice. So you can have water-based uh, adventures. And you also have three lakes that you can use. Uh, Mare Duldan. Lac de Nishir and Redwaters. Yeah, and those lakes are the center of, of life for the Ten Towns. Um, they, they, they make it so you, well, they're, they're, they, they, yeah, they've come together to create the reason for these towns, right? And that the, each of these towns, except for the one that's in the very middle, all the three, the, the uh, nine that border the lakes, they make most of their money from fishing knucklehead trout mm -hmm. that are in these waters. And these are enormous fish that you can land and their bones are then carved out uh, as scrimshaw 
and what is termed white gold or nicknamed white gold in the region because mm -hmm. they're worth a fair bit to carve these up if you are skilled and if you landed a big enough fish then you can sell these to all the people in the rest of the forgotten realms for mm -hmm. marked up prices right so there there is that diversity of uh, possible settings even within a fairly uh, homogenous setting, I guess. Yeah, and, and it's a great point because, and, and you know, it's like there's so much flexibility to this. Each of the towns is different. And though they're small towns and they're rough towns, they have enough variation and breadth that you really can kind of sneak something, whatever you want to sneak into a town, you can find the town where you can put this in. I mean, unless you want a princess castle, okay, sorry. Right. But, you know, anything you could imagine being in a sort of inhospitable type setting, mm -hmm. and uh, it can be, have a Wild West type feel or, sure. you know, a horror feel or whatever. And, and you, can, you can slip it into one of these towns because they are all different in character and they have different ways of going about and, and policing themselves or what they, uh, how lawless or how good they are, you know, all these kind of things. And the adventure represents it with a sort of snowflake system, which is kind of fun. Mm -hmm. um, but there are there is there is wide variety here, and similarly in the wilds the, around these towns, you can kind of sneak anything in there. The map tends to only show the biggest features, mm -hmm. so you can easily be on a trek from one point to another and run through a forest or a small lake or a river or a frozen river. You know, there's just it's it's one of those settings where you can just easily modify things to fit your needs. Right. So let's talk for a moment about the history of Icewind Dale in D&D lore. Um, where did it come from? Where has it gone? And where will it end when we talk about the book itself? Yeah. Well, so, yeah. I, I love the beginning because you and I, you know, as designers, we have had experiences kind of like this to some extent. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So, so if, if you've heard, that. if you've heard, uh, R.A. Salvatore talk about uh, how this book came to be. It's, it's really a great story and it really is sort of the creative by the seat of your pants sort of story. Um, he was hired to write a novel, but he kept uh, be, being either not being able to find an, a, a place for it or being told that the place he had chosen was wrong. Uh, so finally, he got a call saying, well, we're going to put this in a land called the Forgotten Realms. And they sent, uh, TSR sent him the uh, Moonshay Isles novel, Dark, Dark Walker on Moonshay, uh, that Douglas Niles had written. So uh, Mr. Salvatore uh, said, okay. And he set Icewind Dale in the Moonshay Isles because he thought the Moonshay Isles were the Forgotten Realms. And and they sent him a big map and said, well, you can really use anything in this whole big world. So he finally said, oh, well, here's a blank space on this map. I'm going to put it there. And that's how Icewind Dale came to be where it is uh, on the Forgotten Realms map. And I just love that because there have been so many projects where you're working with wizards. And again, I love working with wizards, but it's funny because, you know, be like, okay, cool. I put it on the map of these islands. They're like, oh, no, no, it can't go on the islands. Well, you sent me a map of the islands. Okay, well, here's the map of the whole world. Okay, what about this area? Well, actually, there's another designer working in that area. All right, what about here? And he just had to go through that process. Yeah. And then he got to make it up. And that was sort of the funny thing is because everything right. was taken, right? He ends up just whole cloth making up this part of the world. Right. And it's been a great part of the world, right? It's it's really gone well for all of us. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, it, it's been great for him. It's been great for TSR slash Wizards. It's been great for all of the book publishers and all of the video game makers and all of the uh, tabletop designers who have placed uh, their games there. And video so, games, right? I mean, I think yeah. because... You know, it's not like this was a setting. I mean, he, he wrote the novels and the novels gripped a lot of people. I mean, there were some of the first ones that were uh, widely out there for Forgotten Realms, like the, the Douglas Niles Moonshade ones were the first I read. But shortly thereafter, I read The Crystal right. Shard. Yeah. Um, and I just finished reading it not too long ago with my son and we had a blast. He's devouring all these Driz novels. Mm -hmm. um, and then video games, right? Because it's not like they released adventures for these places. 
uh, but video games explored there. And I right. played those uh, yeah. Icewind Dale video games forever. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's funny. I, I played them not a little bit after they came out, maybe a year or two after they came out. And they came out in 2000. So they were using first and second edition rules, but we were all playing third edition D and D. So yeah. there was this disconnect there, which just shows how, you know, it's so hard to, to bring all of these disparate sort media together to make a cohesive marketing slash story slash, you know, franchise yeah. when, when there's so many moving parts involved. And they would do things like they would publish Driz Dorden's stats in some source book, right. you know, Heroes of the Realms or something. And then so somebody would complain about them and they'd be like, oh, well, that was like, you know, Driz has moved way beyond that. Right. He's not that anymore. You know, it's, right. we wrote that a long time ago and it just showed up right. in shelves, but that's not accurate anymore. Right. <laughs> He's not a fifth level ranger anymore. He's, uh, you know, yeah. and, and it's, yeah, it's just so funny. But that, you know, that's why lore, the, the, and canon the the concept of canon drives me right around the bend uh yeah. because people there are a certain group of fans that cling to canon cling to something that's already established um and have a hard time deviating from that when the world goes on sure the real world goes on so do fake worlds <laughs> fake worlds move <laughs> sometimes even faster sometimes slower but they all move on uh so you know this the history of the, this area is sort of just the story of how it, it started shows how canon is such an ephemeral thing to try to hold on to when the people that are creating it are are just pulling things out of the air <laughs> Because they because they're late for a meeting, right? yeah, or, yeah, or right. you know they're they're in the middle of something and they, they get interrupted and who is going to be this dark elf? What's the name of this dark elf? And and you make right. it up in ten seconds. And then right. how do you spell that? I have no idea. Yeah, yeah. If Sue had been in the meeting. It would end up one way. You know, if yeah. Barb had been in the meeting. It would end up another way. And it right. ended up a particular way. And and we all assume like that was because uh, you know actual wizards and rogues and whatever determined that. But it's it's just yeah. you know at the end of the day, it's all creators right. trying to do the best they can. And, right. But you know, canon is on the other hand important because here we are talking about all this history, right? And, right. and so there is it creates this framework that we can all sort of hang our hat on. And, and yeah. Icewind Dale is a place that has had so much, uh, yeah, just so many touch points for, for fans, right? And, and, yeah. and, and, and what's amazing to me is that it made it all the way through the end of fourth edition without having an actual published adventure there. True. That's true because Legacy of Crystal Shard was a D&D &D next adventure. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the next thing we're going to talk about. I mean, obviously, it's been revisited in source books, novels, uh, I'm sure comic books and, and yeah. you know, go on and on and on all the different media that it's been in uh, D and D next then at the end of fourth edition, as they were getting ready for fifth edition published a, as the D and D encounter season, uh, the legacy of the crystal shard. It was both a source book and an adventure. I just rifled through a ton of uh, old paperbacks adventures and stuff. And I found my copies. Uh, so Yay. Uh, yeah, but it it it's a great it was a great adventure. I remember running it. Uh, had a lot of fun, and it was a it was a good source book, uh, brief, but full of great information for running an adventure. Yeah, this was the second um, of the uh, spell plague adventure, or not spell plague the um, thundering thundering the thundering yep. adventures uh, that were published to sort of help us transition. Uh, to the new 5e adventure while they were playtesting it or 5e new, five new setting uh, edition, 5e edition while they were uh, playtesting it. And so first was Murder in Baldur's Gate and Legacy of the Crystal Shard was second. Uh, and then, then some things happened behind the scenes that resulted in, in I think the format changing, but, but those first two were very similar. Mm -hmm. They had a beautiful DM screen full of really neat notes and very useful stuff. They had a source book part that was, you know, the setting kind of little booklet and then an adventure booklet. And each adventure would have these 
three main things going on. Mm -hmm. And sort of the way it would basically happen is you couldn't do all three. And so when you ran this campaign, the mm -hmm. choices you made necessarily forced your hand into dis making hard decisions of I'm going to help this, but not this. Mm -hmm. And then finding out what happened about with the thing that you did help versus the mm -hmm. or maybe two things that you did help versus the one you didn't. Right. Yeah, it was. Uh, that was the murder in Baldur's Gate template that they then, like you said before, yeah. and it, it carried over nicely. And it was it was fun as the DM to run that. It was wasn't easy to run, but it was fun to run because you got to add a little bit of yourself to the to the running of the adventure as opposed to there's just a one page encounter in front of you. So what do you do? Mm -hmm. Well, and, and the way I understand it is that they did look at the results of what people chose as they're playing the actual encounter season, and that determined the lore. So if you look at the Descent into Avernus book, uh, who's in power in Baldur's Gate is the person who was chosen to sort of be helped right. most often by players in all these various gaming stores, right? And that's so that that canon was created by the players themselves in this That's case and I, and I think yeah. legacy of crystal shard and and probably in rhyme of the frost maiden there is still this sort of link to what players went after versus didn't go after mm -hmm. so what are some of the highlights of a campaign running in this setting of of uh icewind dale and it's a great setting it really is like whenever i look at this I just get excited to run it. Uh, so you've got the 10 towns and, and that is, you know, from the perspective of, of a PC, I think it's sort of the first thing you might think of other than the inhospitable setting right. is that you've got these 10 different towns that are trying to eke out a life. Um, nine of them around lakes and then one of them in the center. And that's Bryn Shander. Mm -hmm. and Bryn Shander was the last one built. It used to be sort of a little trading hut and then got bigger and bigger as a place that could broker deals with the South. Uh, that is all the Sword Coast, uh, and trade between all the others. It also, because it had some money, could wall itself off and be a place that could be a, a haven. So it kind of got big. And even though it's not on the waters, it, it made money through all this trade. Uh, and that's sort of a, I mean, it's not cosmopolitan, but it's big and, and can feel a little more normal. And then you can go into these other independent towns. And what I like the most about these 10 towns is that they all fight. <laughs> it's not like a consortium of 10 well-intentioned, friendly places. It's like right. they will argue and compete over knucklehead trout to the point of bloodshed. Right. Yeah, there's always... It's usually never outright warfare although sometimes right. it, it does come to bloodshed but it you know it's this sort of small town politics yeah uh personality conflicts you know that that sort of thing um that can be really fun to hang a campaign on or at least to to build a campaign underpinnings on those little details yeah and in the novel series and in the uh adventures one of the things that that you often see is that because these towns are in conflict uh and because the council that each of the towns sends a member to because those can't they can't just get along and they have these rivalries and divisions and histories that is exploited against them right it's what it makes them vulnerable it makes them vulnerable in the first crystal shard adventure or novel where um uh, a car kessel comes in and attacks you know they can't take on an attack because they can't agree and and they'll literally risk their livelihoods over sort of these ancient rivalries mm -hmm. uh which is great stuff for a dm to play with right because char right. characters players see that and they go i, I gotta fix this right right and that creates what? that creates conflict for the players to be involved in right or you know some right. group gives if, if a if a member of even a council for one town tells you something bad about another town it could be made up Right. Or maybe it really is real. Right. And, and that yeah. kind of thing is, is exciting to play with as a DM. Right. And then you can always do the, well, we will help this other town, but we need you to yeah. do, you know, and then you can get some quests going that way. So outside of the 10 towns, there are other folks who live in the area. And these are the Reged tribes. Uh, they are nomads for the most part uh, who in the earliest iterations of Icewind Dale fought against the Ten Towns. 
So, you know, in, in this sense, they were the wild barbarian tribes uh, that would attack and uh, sort of like a, uh, you know, the, the Scandinavian, you know, yeah. long ship. Vikings. Viking. And, yeah, they have that aspect. I mean, you know, you can't completely fault uh, R.A. Salvatore. Like, like he, he does write, um, you know, they are different peoples, right? They, the, the barbarians right. themselves, just like the Ten Towns, have a number of different, uh, they are in tribes. Uh, mm-hmm. So there's that to it. But, but they are, you know, different tribes with different motivations and different ways that they all revere Tempest, the god of war. Mm-hmm. And they have a moot where they decide who will lead. And that kind of creates the tenor of the barbarian ragged tribes for the next however long. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so what that result may be can can greatly change how they are. And and, right. and I think over time, this concept, which is, you know, it's it's got a, some problems with it. Sure. Um, D, TSR wizards, they have they have refined it over the years to make it more. Uh, interesting and 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 less about uh, less black and white, right? And and right. so um, I think in the in at least by Legacy of the Crystal Shard, so when when Fifth Edition was starting, um, you have a situation where the tribes have been working with, and this is part of the novels as well. They've been working with the Ten Towns in various ways, mm-hmm. and while their ways are not those of the Ten Towns, and they don't just want to settle and live there, some of them do. Right. Uh, and there are intermarriages and all that sort of things. And there are potential allies that can be either group can win the other uh, over yeah. and, and alliances out about any particular issue. Right. It, it turns them um, from the villain, right. The mustache twirling villain to, yeah. to more like a real story character, right. A, yeah. a, a rounded character that has different motivations uh, from not just tribe to tribe, but from person to person within a tribe. And I think Salvatore always had this idea, and you see it in, in Wolfgar, who's a barbarian that um, is, is sort of, he's knocked unconscious during a battle and, and, and awoken by a dwarf who takes him under a sort of a indentured servitude almost kind of thing. But but at the end, he sort of says, great, you can rejoin your people. You've, you've fulfilled your sort of oath time of serving me. Uh, and And... And it's a way of sort of showing that each individual, right? The, the, each barbarian is an individual. Mm-hmm. And while they may make decisions based on leadership, i.e. the way all countries do and all groups right. of people do, sure. they are all individuals, right? And they all have right. a different story to tell and a reasoning and so on. Yep. Now, another uh, factor in the setting over the additions and over the various uh, points of media have been the Arcane Brotherhood and the Netherese angle. Do you want to talk about that for a second? Yeah, so the Arcane Brotherhood is a really cool place steeped into the lore of the Forgotten Realms. And the short version of it is that uh, a Netherese wizard and, and Netherese are sort of these shadow, tied to shadow wizards that ruled in Forgotten Realms. And they largely disappeared from the Forgotten Realms to live in the shadow world, Shadowfell. Um, but they built a tower called the Host Tower of the Arcane. And at one point to escape an evil species that was attacking the realms, they teleported it to what is now the city of Leskun. And that tower has caused all kinds of trouble. But when it's, uh, when it's kind of functioning and open, it has been ruled by a group of wizards. And these wizards uh, are known as the Arcane Brotherhood. And they use the knowledge within to power their magic. And they seek more magic. Uh, and more knowledge so they can meet their goals. And their main goal is power Mm -hmm. through profit. So they engage in trade, they engage in finding lore, uh, and the things they do are often nefarious, not just because they're evil, but it's because they're looking for power. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's the old, it's kind of the Victor Frankenstein thing, uh, except he wasn't doing it for profit, but, you know, taking the magic a little too far. Uh, and they're always uncovering the thing that could destroy the world next because of their lack of wisdom, despite their high intelligence. Yeah. Uh, they were so. part of the original Crystal Shard story. And in that story, they, they uh, strand a wizard that a couple of Arcane Brotherhood uh, wizards have, have conned a wizard into murdering one of their their own. And then they leave him out in the frost to die. And that wizard ends up finding the super powerful artifact, the Crystal Shard. Uh, and causing trouble in the whole region. 
Mm -hmm. uh, they don't then react by apologizing in the sequel adventure that came out in D&D Next Legacy of Crystal Shard. The Arcane Brotherhood comes back to try to find whatever happened to Carcastle and they find him as a lich and they're like, sweet, let's totally work with you, buddy. Yeah. Um, and liches go with the Arcane Brotherhood. Uh, the last leader that they mm -hmm. had, and I don't think there's an update in the Sword Coast Adventures Guide, but it was Ar Arclem Gleeth mm -hmm. was a lich. And he worked with Valindra Shadowmantle and I believe helped her become a lich. She's the lich who tries to destroy Neverwinter all the time. Right. Um, works for the Thans sometimes. Um, so, I mean, really bad people have been in charge of the Arcane Brotherhood. Uh, Greef was destroyed. Valindra has his uh, phylactery. And, you know, so there's always this, is he going to come back? Right. Um, but it just shows you that, you know, you know, you're dealing with that kind of organization when, when these are their leaders, right? Yep. And speaking of the Arcane Brotherhood doing bad things, uh, one of the points in most stories set in this area is Shardolin. Uh, do you, can you talk about that for, for a moment? Yeah, this is a neat, really neat take on lore. And you talk about how lore can change. And this is one of them. So in the... Uh, original story of the crystal shard the crystal shard which is an artifact called crinchinibon is used by the wizard akar kessel to create towers um, that are made of this dark crystal and this is definitely from the school of thought of like well it's evil so it's colored black right mm -hmm. and when it shatters at the end of the novel and good guys win this black ice is scattered all over the place and in the early dnd next adventure legacy crystal shard this black ice has sort of tainted the land and um, this is the kind of naming that needs to go, right? We need to rethink how, how we approach these things. And uh, the D&D team at Wizards has been doing this as they you know, work with old lore. Mm -hmm. And they took a really cool idea. So we're now no longer using this term black ice mm -hmm. uh, that was used as early as the beginning of 5e. We're now using the term chardolin, which is a old word that was used in D&D around the netherese the netherese used to have this substance that was kind of brittle card chardolin and it worked a little bit like a spell scroll you could empower a spell in it and then when you crush this stone the spell would be released mm -hmm. and you could use it sort of to throw it and set up a fireball or to break it and kind of you know get some spell cast on you um, and it was highly coveted it kind of looked like an opal it was sort of a, a, a dark opal Mm -hmm. And so this is now what uh, is really taking place, right? The remnant of the crystal shard is Shardolin, um, even sounds perfect together. And this is a thing that is linked to the ancient Netherese, which open, opens all kinds of opportunities. Um, I think uh, this is a really neat change. Yep. And it is a substance that can be worked sort of like an iron ore uh, and using it wearing it, wielding a weapon by it, tends to have um, some properties that you might not want. It corrupts a bit. Yeah. So, so that's always an interesting um, dynamic, I think, in a game, uh, to have something that's powerful but also dangerous. As a DM, you can play with that. If you have characters or players who uh, throw caution to the wind for power, Boy, where have we heard that before, Arcane Brotherhood? Um, <laughs> yeah. And then you can you can um, you know tempt them and create some interesting stories that way. Well, and we've seen some windows into this through product releases because uh, WizKids has this dragon miniature you can buy. We talked about in the last episode that is a Shardolin dragon, and that right. sounds amazing. Yeah, I I want to make one of those. <laughs> Well, there have been some really neat things. So uh, Neverwinter, the video game, the MMO, mm -hmm. uh, it, use, it, it has a whole Icewind Dale section of the game that you can mm -hmm. play in. And it used the legacy of the Crystal Shard concept to create several areas and release them for players. And you fight some really neat things there. Like there'll be like polar bears that'll have Shardolin pieces embedded in them. Mm -hmm. Or there will be a black ice beholder is what they call it in there, right? But a Shardolin beholder that's like mm -hmm. a sort of purple black opalescent beholder that uh, has special qualities. And, nice. and so there's a lot you can do with Shardolin that can make for a really neat experience. So I'm excited yeah. to see what the book has in it. Yep. So those are the things that we're going to be looking for 
as we take our tour through the book uh, to see what's carried over, what's changed, and so on. Can I add one other important thing? You certainly can, my friend. So uh, another really important part is the gods. We mentioned Tempest, uh, yes. revered by many of the Regged tribes. Uh, Tempest is important as a god of war, but we also have uh, a goddess that's really important, which is Oral. Right. And she is known as the Frost Maiden. So she gets title name. <laughs> right. She, she's and, got her name on the marquee. And she's got another, a, a number of cool names. Ice Dawn, the cold goddess, goddess of winter, the frost sprite queen, uh, an, an endless number of, of names you can look up. Uh, she has often guided uh, people of the Ten Towns, the Regged Barbarians, any number of groups there. She has had a hand in it. She's a little bit like Umberly, mm -hmm. right? She's that yeah. kind of like, she's, she feels evil and everybody's afraid of her, but you might, you know, you're going to take that important ship voyage. Well, you right. toss some coins over yep. to Umberly and yeah. say, thank you. And, and please, you know, watch yeah. over me during my journey. Right. Yeah. And then, yeah, it's the same thing in, in the Icewind Dale. If you're going to take a trip, out into the wild, you're probably going to say a little prayer to, to Oral to not have her focus her attention on you. Yeah. And in, yeah. in the Legacy of the Crystal Shard adventure, one of the three things you could choose to be involved in was opposing how Oral had empowered a barbarian outcast mm -hmm. to become, uh, she's known as Hedrin the Ice Witch, and she had yeah. taken over the tribe of the bear, weakened another tribe, and is sort of creating all these uh storms and things like that and so clearly she was not bested sufficiently yeah uh, because she's she's back <laughs> yeah. it's pretty obvious that she's gonna be back in this new book right it, you know in one of her iterations it's just wanting to destroy life right anything that gives off heat yeah. uh, so in in that in her essence uh, of in that form she is constantly attacking any civilization uh and and the Ten Towns in particular being uh, the only civilizations in Icewind Dale uh, of any note. So, all right. Uh, is there anything else you wanted to say before we sign out for this episode? Well, yeah, just that if folks um, who are listening uh, have specific questions about the history of Icewind Dale, or if you're a fan of Icewind Dale and there are parts of it that you want us to see us, talk about you know maybe you're a big fan of the dragon icing death from the original novel or some other part that you say you know oh i'd like to hear more about that uh let us know yep and you can let us know in a variety of ways you can let us know by hitting us on twitter and we'll give you our twitter handles in a moment um, you can let us know on our forums at forums.misdirectedmark.com uh, you can let us know at misdirectedmark.com where we put up our episodes. Uh, there is a section of just down with D&D &D, and for each episode, there is a place to put comments. Um, so any or all of those places are places you can talk with us. And if you're a patron of the show, you can also talk to us on our Patreon page, patreon.com slash MMP. Uh, to become a patron, you can go there and for as little as a dollar a month, uh, you can support us, keep the lights on and, and chat with us and talk to us. Uh, so thank you if you are a patron. Thank you if you are a listener. We appreciate it. Uh, Teos, where can people find you on social media? Yeah, thank you, everyone. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at AlphaStream, and my blog is alphastream.org. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Sean Merwin, or you can go to those forums I talked about at forums.misdirectedmark.com. Down with the Indie is a Misdirected Mark production, the media arm of Encoded Designs. So Teos... My friend, my you lost wanderer. What are we going to do now? Let's stumble through the snow and kill some monsters that are embedded with shards of shardolin Woo. and have an amazing adventure. Yeah, I'm, I'm cold just thinking about it. You're done with D&D. &D. Yeah, you know me. You're done with D&D. &D. Yeah, you know me. You're done with D&D. &D. Yeah, you know me. Who's done with D&D? You're done with D&D. Yeah, you know me. You're done with D&D. I'm down with D&D. Who's down with D&D?
And then take a deep breath of breathable air.